afternoon and for those of you who are joining online perhaps good morning good afternoon or maybe even good evening um welcome to the february edition of berlin epidemiological methods colloquium my name is chisato ito and i'm a doctorate student at the institute of public health at the charite and together with my colleagues megan forrest toibo glatz and tobias scott we bring these epidemiological methods talks every first wednesday of the month Today, we have Dr. Jay Kaufman with us today. He um, is a professor at the Department of Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Occupational Health at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. He's also a visiting professor um, in the School of Public Health of the University of Chile. Um, and there are many things to, I think, mention about Dr. Kaufman, but I will um, try to keep it short today. He's an uh, editor um, for the journal Epidemiology. He's also a co-editor of the book Methods in Social Epidemiology. And notably, he is the past president of the U.S. Society for Epidemiologic Research in 2020 to 2021 as well. And his research focus spans from social epidemiology, health disparities, epidemiological methods, and causal inference. And yeah, not lots of expertise that I'm hoping that he can share with us today, but he is here today to share his thoughts on the ethics of adjustment. And I would like to give the mic to you, Dr. Kaufman. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my first time in Berlin. So thank you for bringing out your very best weather for me. Um, I'm here in Europe, actually, for the year uh, on a sabbatical. I was asked to write a, a book, which I have a textbook, but I never actually just wrote a book before. So it's my first time doing that. And uh, they asked me to write a, a, a general or a popular book, not just for epidemiologists, but for a broader audience. So I'm struggling with that because I don't know how to explain these things without using technical terms. And the topic of the book is about adjustment strategies that we use and, and particularly uh, social controversies or, or social um, disagreements uh, in, in the press and in public policy that revolve around adjustment decisions, because this is something that the general public doesn't have a lot of awareness about, and epidemiologists are supposed to know a lot about this. And in particular, the focus is on uh, racial and ethnic disparities, uh, particularly in the United States, because that's where there's put a focus on public health uh, monitoring uh, racial and ethnic disparities for issues of equality or inequality. Uh, so I realized that's a little bit of a, a, maybe an unfamiliar topic in the German context where you don't quite have that same role for public health in monitoring racial and ethnic disparities. Uh, but you just uh, have to recognize that in the United States, it's a priority because it was only relatively recently in my lifetime that uh, African-Americans got full legal rights in the United States. Only in 1965 did people have full rights as citizens on the basis of skin color, on the basis of race. And so this sets up a situation of tremendous inequalities, not just in public health, but in education and employment and so forth. And so the monitoring of these inequalities is, a, is an important uh, public um, uh, activity. Uh, and the adjustment of these inequalities then becomes a very important issue as well. And so we have to talk about that. Um, we're all familiar with epidemiologic methods and motivations for adjustment and uh, the principles that underlie that and the, um, the importance of randomization as the kind of a motivating principle behind what we're trying to get to with adjustment. And this goes back quite a long time. If we go back uh, even to John Snow in the middle of the 19th century, there, even though there's not the formalism about randomized trials yet, there's still the awareness of the balance of covariates as a primary principle in thinking about what underlies a valid causal inference. So Snow is here talking in his cholera study in 1855 about the advantage of having balanced covariates through this natural experiment that he used in the distribution of water in, in London as justifying a valid causal inference. And this wouldn't become formalized until much later. So then you had Neyman in the 1920s, coming up with formalisms for why randomization achieves this balance of covariates that, that permits causal inference. And finally, within epidemiology, you have this kind of revolution in the 1980s, where we have uh, a formal definition of confounding as this kind of imbalance between covariates that leads to uh, counterfactual contrasts as the, as the basis of what we're trying to 
do with confounding adjustments in order to get rid of this. But this is all based around experiments and randomization as uh, a motivator. And um, you have these different scenarios. This is from the Robbins paper in 2000, where if you have a situation where you have uh, randomization of your exposure A here, uh, as you would in a randomized trial, then the balance or imbalance of a covariate like L is inconsequential. It doesn't affect the exposure and not correlated with the exposure. And so uh, it doesn't matter for your purposes what uh, the distribution of L is with respect to the outcome or um, you don't have to measure L, you don't have to worry about it because it doesn't have any relationship with A, uh, the exposure. And then in the situation that um, L is associated with A here, um, then you are obligated to measure this and account for it in some way, stratify on it, adjust for it in some way in order to remove this biasing of the effects that comes from the fact that um, L is a, a cause of A and also a cause of Y. And so uh, it's a confounder in the sense that you have this confusion of the two effects, the, the L effect on Y and the A effect on Y. And you have to get rid of that confusion in order to get rid of the confounding. And then, of course, in the extreme situation where you have unmeasured variables that also have that confounding pathway, then you're out of luck, right? Then the adjustment is not going to get you where you want to get. So you want to be in this sweet spot in the middle where you have tractable confounding that you can get rid of through adjustment in order to get you to the situation that you would have been in if you had the randomization. So again, you have randomization as the, as the motivating principle here, the, the experiment as the ideal, as the gold standard for adjustment purposes. Um, and this is now uh, formalized even further into the idea relatively recently of the target trial. That when you do an observational study, you think about the randomized trial that you wish you could have done. And then you try to emulate all of the, uh, the adjustments that you need to make in order to return to that ideal trial that you would have conducted if you could. And by thinking through all those steps in the randomized trial, and how your, got, your data got generated and to go backwards to make it like a, a trial helps you in thinking about all the ways in which you could deviate from the trial and to get back to that. But all of this works where you have an exposure that you could have randomized and you're thinking about the effect of an exposure, but these are not the only activities that epidemiologists engage in. As I was saying at the beginning, I'm interested for the purposes of this book and in my, my own work about things like the surveillance of disparity. Right? I, I don't have an exposure that I'm going to randomize in the surveillance of disparities. And so I need a different foundation for adjustment to think about why I would adjust or not adjust in those kinds of circumstances. We have a number of different activities that we do as epidemiologists for which adjustments might be necessary. And we need different strategies for these situations as well. And I would categorize them in the following way. We, we could, might be interested in the real world at the present time. And that's what we typically refer to as uh, surveillance or description. Uh, we might be interested in the real world in the future, which is uh, clinical prediction models. Like, uh, you know, I want to know if this patient will get cancer, right? That's a, I, I have to say something about the future. I don't get to observe it directly as I do in the surveillance, but I still might need to engage in some kind of adjustments. And then I have the hypothetical world in the future. That's not the real world anymore. This is some world that's defined by if I did something, you know, if I did thing A for a uh, if in contrast to that, I did thing B, then only one of those things could be true. So my estimate is made up of some part that's true and some part that's not true. Um, and this is, of course, causal inference. And most of what we talk about in epi methods has to do with number three here. But of course, we need methods also for number one and number two. Uh, and this foundation that I talked about in randomization doesn't apply in those situations. So we need a, a different kind of foundation. Um, there were a couple of articles that came out recently talking about revitalizing descriptive epidemiology, and they touched on this a little bit, but not quite enough. So I'm going to push a little bit further on that. Um, these authors, Fox and, and co-authors here, say that uh, the SARS-CoV-2 outbreak um, reinforced the importance of surveillance, uh, reminded us that this is an important public health activity. Uh, we want to know who's dying according to age, sex, race, SES. Uh, we want to know where people are dying and how that changes over time. And these are important surveillance functions. Um, and they go on to say, when the goal of the study of descriptors, first question to ask is, um, uh, what is the goal of this description? And does it require adjustment for variables? Um, so this is obviously something we have to answer right off the bat. They say there are important reasons why you might want to adjust for things. 
um, that differ across the population, but they don't really tell you what those reasons might be. They just say there might be situations where we might want to adjust for things. They say that these adjustments might help you hypothesize about the reasons for the variability, but that's kind of vague. It doesn't give you a, a gold standard for uh, how you would know what to adjust for, what not to adjust for. Um, and they warn that in other instances, the adjustment could be misleading. But again, they're kind of vague about this. They just kind of warn you that it might be helpful, it might be harmful. So good luck figuring that out. Um, in a subsequent article, the same authors or, or some subset of these authors went on to write another paper in AJE, um, Lesko et al. in 2022, um, in which they said that in general, descriptive studies should be unadjusted because the real world is unadjusted. So if you want to describe the real world, that's probably also unadjusted. Um, but they just say that uh, there might be some cases in which you might want to adjust um, and you'll have to figure that out. So again, there's not very much guidance. So uh, let's look at just a quick, simple situation where it seems obvious we want to adjust for something. So here's an example I, I took um, from an old textbook by Vic Schoenbach. Um, and we're just looking at mortality for Miami and Alaska among uh, white women in um, the United States in the 1970s. And immediately you see that um, the mortality rate in Miami is 8.9 per thousand per year. And in Alaska is 2.67 per thousand per year. And so clearly uh, Miami is the more dangerous place, right? So I'm gonna move to Alaska so I can live longer uh, because the mortality rate is so much lower there. Now you might, as an epidemiologist, immediately realize that this is a little bit suspicious because if you look at the age specific mortality rates, they're not really very different at all, right? They're quite a bit more similar, you know, 65 plus there, 39.11 for Miami, 39 for Alaska, it's actually quite similar. So what's happening is that the age distribution is different and age of course is an important predictor of mortality. So it's no surprise that the two populations differ in their age distributions. You have different uh, mortality rates um, and you might wanna, you might feel that that's a nuisance that you don't want to have to report, right? That uh, you might want to adjust for age there to say, if I have two people of roughly the same age, does one have a higher mortality rate than the other because of the place that they live? And standardization, of course, is a typical tool that we might use to do that because we consider age to be a nuisance here, right? And why do we consider age to be a nuisance? It's because we accept as a normative judgment that old people are supposed to die at a higher rate than young people. Right? It's because we accept that as normative that we say, well, that's, I'm going to take that off the table. Right? I don't want to look at the effect of age. I want to look at the effect after I take out any effects due to age. I consider it a nuisance because I accept it as just uh, part of the natural world, right? the, na the natural way that things should work. So the adjustment distorts the data. Right? The, the mortality rates that I showed on the first slide are the real mortality rates. And if my purpose in describing it is to figure out, you know, what is the business climate for um, uh, uh, funeral homes? You know, how many caskets do I need in funeral homes? Well, for that purpose, I want the crude data, right? The actual number of deaths. I don't want to get rid of the age distribution. And that's what the Fox article was mentioning, that if you adjusted for age there, you'd actually get the wrong answer because it wouldn't tell you how many caskets you need because that's a function of the crude data. But if I really want to know if one place is uh, performing poorly in its public health uh, activities so that the death rate is elevated beyond what it should be, then I might wanna get rid of the effective age and I'm gonna distort the data in order to do that. So I'm no longer talking about the real world. I'm talking about a world that hypothetically has the same age distribution for Miami and Alaska, even though that world doesn't exist, but it's, it's a more useful, uh, um, a more useful, um, um, like an uh, artificial world for me to make inferences about than the real world. So the adjustment formula is trivial. You learned this in your master's classes. Um, I make these weights out of the, age, the strata specific estimates. Uh, and I apply those weights to the population. And then the numbers that I get represent the crude death rates that would have hypothetically been experienced if these two places had the same age distribution. Um, as the standard, I have to pick a, a standard. Somewhat arbitrarily, I have to identify Alaska to be the standard or Miami to be the standard. Or in this case, actually I use the whole United States as the standard to take the weights from. Um, 
Um, so this is a, a fiction, but a convenient one because it removes the distorting effect of age to get a fairer comparison, what we might describe as being more fair, right? So when we do this, we see that the mortality rates, the age-adjusted mortality rates are actually quite similar, 6.9 versus 6.7. So there's really no uh, meaningful difference between these two places once we account for the different age distributions. Now, it's important to remember that this is a fiction, and I think because of it's so routinely reported, we often forget that we're making things up here, that we're, we're living in, a, in an artificial world when we report the age-adjusted rates instead of the crude rates. So one reminder of that was this nice article by Krieger and Williams uh, around 2000. The interesting thing that happened in 2000 was that they changed the, the age standard that was used for government reporting in the United States. So uh, the, for many years, everybody was using the 1940 census as the age standard. It got older and older, the population age distribution changed over time. Some agencies shifted to the 1970 census after that came out, but others didn't and continued to use the 1940 census. So then it was confusing to compare numbers between agencies. So finally in 2000, they said, okay, this is getting too old and too confusing. Let's just all agree to go with the uh, new age distribution from the 2000 census. So when they did that and they applied it, um, of course, all the numbers changed because their age adjusted now to a new standard. And the population in 2000 was much older than it had been in 1940 or 1970. Um, one artifactual thing that happens is that um, when you have a ratio measure, like um, you know a disparity between groups measured on the ratio scale, as you increase the baseline risk, that ratio tends toward the null. Right? Just think about it. If the baseline risk is 50%, your, your ratio can't be greater than two because the numerator can't be more than twice as big as the denominator. It's a, it's a, a, a general phenomenon ratios that as you increase the baseline risk, the ratio tends toward the null. So of course, what happened is that ratio disparities, uh, Krieger and Williams looked at socioeconomic and racial disparities, um, disparities in mortality in this older population, right? Uh, drifted more toward the null. So you see like, uh, you know, what had been a ratio of 6.4 became a ratio of 5.2 and what had been a ratio of five became a ratio of three and a half and so forth. And so the administration at the time, I guess it was George W. Bush in 2000, got to uh, brag about the fact that they reduced racial and ethnic and socioeconomic disparities and mortality by 20% or 30%. And they did it just by changing the age standard. Um, but that was a, a big accomplishment to that administration. Just reminds you how artificial are the numbers that are reported, because you can change things dramatically just by changing something as arbitrary as the standard. Okay, we need a, a foundation for thinking about what would be our motivation for adjusting for things? What variables should we adjust for? And what would be enough of an adjustment to be a complete adjustment? Like, when are we done? You know, we, we have an ideal from randomized trials about adjusting uh, sufficiently to get to the right answer, but what is the right answer when we have a descriptive disparity like this? So now we have to think about the distinction between um, health inequalities and health inequities. That These disparities are made up of, of differences between mortality rates or disease rates or whatever other uh, outcome that we're studying. But not every difference is something that is um, uh, morally unacceptable or ethically unacceptable to us, right? Some differences might be judged to be um, natural or appropriate or acceptable in some way. So we have to make a, dis a distinction between mathematical inequalities um, and inequities that are in some way morally objectionable, right? Uh, for example, uh, poor people, um, die younger than rich people, right? That might be uh, morally objectionable to us. We think that people are equally deserving of life and you shouldn't have a shorter life just because you were born poor. It's not really fair. Um, likewise, lower social class infants have lower birth weight, might be judged to be inappropriate that everybody should have an equal start at life. Uh, but smokers get more lung cancer than non-smokers. Is that unjust that smokers get more lung cancer? well, then it becomes less obvious that that's something that we would consider to be uh, a moral affront. Uh, that women live longer than men 
is true in every society that I know about. Um, is it morally objectionable? Um, I, I, personally, I would say so, but if I ask somebody else who is a woman, they might think that it's just the natural order of things. So these become uh, questions of debate. Should uh, poor people die more than uh, uh, rich people? Should women live longer than men? These are ethical questions about uh, what's normative, what's appropriate, what's acceptable. And we have to make a judgment about uh, what we're going to adjust for based on whether we find that to be an acceptable reason to die or to get the outcome or not. In the age adjustment for Miami versus um, um, Alaska, we considered age to be a normative reason for dying. Like it was appropriate that older people should die more than young people. And so we took that off the table. We removed it for consideration because we accepted it as, as just the way the world works. But we might not feel the same way about smokers getting lung cancer. Like when we look at lung cancer rates, do we adjust for smoking and say, well, okay, given that you have two people who, um, who did smoke or didn't smoke, I'm only interested in comparing those. No, actually, we leave the smoking in. We don't adjust that away. We consider that to be an intervenable cause of disease that we're, we're interested in. We don't want to take that off the table. So my conjecture here is that the statistical adjustments we use for the surveillance purposes are intended to turn mathematical inequalities into inequities, right? To be able to interpret them morally uh, or ethically as what we judge to be relevant and actionable and um, uh, objectionable, and what we remove from consideration because we consider it to be um, just the way the world works, something that's not uh, something, something we should focus on. Um, I, I looked for a foundation for this kind of a setup, and I found one in a somewhat obscure article from 2008 uh, by an author, Duan, who I, I don't particularly know. Um, actually, Chaoli Meng here is a very famous causal statistician at Harvard, um, but I, 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 in general, I don't know these authors very well. Um, but they did, in a, in a formal way, set up this kind of a, uh, an approach where you would have some covariates that are um, acceptable and some that are unacceptable as reasons for disparities. Um, this paper has not been cited very much. It's not very widely known or used, um, but they were responding to a re uh, report by the Institute of Medicine defining what would be a, a healthcare disparity as racial or ethnic differences in the quality of healthcare that are not due to access related factors or clinical needs, preference or appropriate inter intervention. The reason they made this definition, they're interested in clinical care, right? And they're interested in assigning responsibility or blame to a clinician for differences in the care that's received by a patient. Uh, in particular, they're interested in racial ethnic differences. Uh, if, if there are differences in say access related factors, say the clinic is out in a rural area and the patient can't get to the clinic as easily, that's not the fault of the clinician, right? The, 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 it's not something that the, the provider is doing. If, if the patient can't get to the clinic door, that's somebody's problem, but it's not the problem of the clinic, right? So the Institute of Medicine said, this is not then a, a racial disparity um, that we're interested in because this is not something that's the responsibility of the clinician. So it can't be due to preferences or appropriateness of intervention or uh, access related factors because we can't blame the clinician for those things. This definition is inherently causal because you have to know the reasons for the disparity. Like it's due to thing A or it's due to thing B. So if you know what everything is due to, you have a whole DAG for where the disparity comes from and you can piece out these things that's due to this, but it's not due to that. So that requires a lot of causal knowledge, right? And um, it's also explicitly value-laden because it says certain things are the fault of the clinician and certain things are not the fault of the clinician based on some kind of uh, distinction about what, what they could do, what, or whether the disparity arises from something that they have done or could have done or didn't do. Uh, so these authors make the statistical framework to distinguish these allowable from the non-allowable categories of, of covariates. And the allowable covariates then are statistically adjusted away. These are things you put in your model, like we put age in the model for Miami and Alaska, 
to remove that from consideration. So this is something that we wouldn't have to think further about. The remaining covariates are not allowable, and therefore the clinician gets blamed for those things, right? Um, so just to make the ethical basis for the distinction clearer, um, if something is affected by tastes or preferences, it's allowable because, you know, if the patient says, if you say to the patient, I want you to take this pill, and the patient says, I don't like taking pills, I'm not going to do that. Well, that's their choice. Like, that's not the clinician's fault. So, you know, if, if the patient says, I, I take this responsibility myself to behave in this way, nothing the clinician can do about that. So that's allowable. Right, but it's not allowable if it's a constraint on the patient that is outside of their agency. You know, if if they can't take the pill because it's not available in their neighborhood, then that is unacceptable because people are then denied some kind of agency in their health. Some kind of potential health is denied to them, so that becomes not allowable. That's sort of the ethical distinction that's being used here in order to make this distinction. Um, obviously, there are many problems in parsing those things out, like knowing which things are allowable and which things are not allowable is not a simple thing in practice. And depending on your purpose in writing the paper, you're going to make different decisions and different analysts may also make different decisions. So agreeing on these things is not um, easy. And from paper to paper, we have to make a new decision every time, depending on our purpose. So this, this is a very difficult thing for people to do in practice because it's not like you can just learn a routine and do that every time. You have to think about the purpose of your research and you have to think about the ethics of allowable versus not allowable covariates um, and make those judgments yourself, which is a lot to do and then a lot to communicate in the paper. Um, so for example, in the Institute of Medicine report, they're studying the clinicians. And so the things like access that are outside of the control of the clinician are not blamed on the clinician. But if I was doing a paper about a health service, like a, a system, right, then having a clinic that's in the rural area that was set up by the health ser service uh, in a way that was inaccessible to patients, that is something that I would blame them for. They could have put the clinic someplace else that was accessible. So what is uh, it, inadmissible in one place might be admissible in another place, depending on the purpose of my study. So Fox and Lesko, the articles there alluded to this, that it would have to do with your purpose. So the first thing you need to do when you do the study is think about what my purpose is here and how am I going to define these variables as being acceptable versus, versus unacceptable. The statistical adjustment then is this tool by which we end up blaming individuals or absolving them of that blame like saying you are not to blame for this. I've adjusted that away. I've used a statistical technique in order to remove that from the difference so that you will not get blamed for that, right? So this is a kind of a, an absolution that we give as statisticians to various actors to say, don't worry, you're not responsible for this. Uh, absolution maybe is a, an obscure English word, um, meaning like what the priest does when he says, you know, I remove the sins from you. Right, that, that you are no longer responsible for those sins. You have been forgiven for those sins. So this is what this is the power we have as statisticians and analysts to absolve people of their sins. Um, these adjustments might then create an artificial world that might not even be able to exist. Right, just this is true of all statistical adjustments that they have this power to create hypothetical or counterfactual worlds that might be implausible or might be impossible, right? And one of the things that Duan points out in this article from 2008 is that um, if the allowable things affect the non-allowable things, right, then you want to condition on those allowable things. And this is what people do. They adjust for the allowable things and then they get the differences uh, in the non-allowable things. You know, th those are left in the difference there. And this is the way that almost all articles are analyzed, as though the allowable things affect the non-allowable things. And, you know, they're further to the left in the DAG because that's what these conditional disparities uh, reflect. But what if you have a situation where the non-allowable things affect the allowable things? Then actually you don't want a disparity conditioned on the allowable things. You want to marginalize over the non-allowable things in order to get the um, disparity that includes the allowable things, right? And that would require 
uh, like Robin's G formula, right? Which I'm sure is absent in 99% of all published disparity, right? And in fact, I only know, I can only think of one author writing now about disparities who actually pays attention to this issue of whether you want to marginalize over a covariate or condition on that covariate. And that's this guy in Hopkins named John Jackson. So a couple of articles here that he wrote uh, continuing on this line of thinking that Duan set up, but that's like the only one that I know about. And you have a whole industry of people out there generating articles where they're adjusting for things without any attention to this distinction whatsoever. And the, the Duan article actually shows that you could, um, uh, if you did this adjustment the wrong way, you could actually flip the disparity. Uh, they, they give some examples of like Simpson's paradox where, you know, the conditional disparity is on the opposite side of the null from the marginal disparity. And so if you did this adjustment in the wrong direction, you get the opposite answer. So it, it, in principle, could be very consequential. Um, this also connects to a literature now that's very trendy in uh, computer science, artificial intelligence, about fairness, right? Because our purpose in making these ethical judgments between or distinctions between allowable and non-allowable uh, covariates has to do with some kind of an idea of what would be fair and what would be unfair. You know, the idea that smokers get more lung cancer seems not to be terribly unfair because they had some agency to do that to themselves. And when it gets to things like obesity, right, that's a huge debate in the United States about obesity, about whether it's uh, volitional or not volitional. You know, like, is obesity something that you have control over? Or is obesity something you don't have control over? Because this has huge implications for, implications for how people think about these kinds of questions about uh, allowable versus not allowable covariates. You know, is it your fault or is it not your fault? Now, this is in the news because now we have a, a drug that's uh, available, newly available to treat obesity. Um, and the uh, American Association for Pediatrics just came out with a new statement saying this drug should be given to children because childhood obesity is such a problem with no attention whatsoever to issues of like changing diet. Uh, they said, no, changing diet doesn't work. So we need to give this drug or bariatric surgery for kids, all right? Because they don't actually have volitional control over this. It's not an issue that people can just, you know, control for themselves. So there's a huge scientific debate now and more than a scientific debate, sort of a, an ethics debate about whether this is really in the control of individuals or not. So this is consequential for ideas about fairness. So this connects to the computer science and artificial intelligence world because of um, an interest in algorithmic bias and how fairness or lack of fairness in algorithms, um, how to program into artificial intelligence systems, these kinds of distinctions. So this is connected then through the causal inference world, through the, the computer science and artificial intelligence world, with the work of Pearl on DAGs and thinking about disparities arising through a kind of a DAG structure here with like X in this diagram being the demographic factor that the, what do they call it? The protected class that you are interested in like race or sex and how it can be correlated with the outcome because of a confounder like Z or through mediation by variables like W and then defining what would be an acceptable versus an unacceptable difference in terms of these kinds of covariates. So there's this big world now of artificial intelligence people and things like that that are working on these kinds of models. Um, this connects a little bit with um, epidemiology through the mediation people like Tyler Vanderweel, who set up a similar problem for thinking about racial disparities in mediation context, right? So, you know, in a typical mediation model, you have, you know, the exposure and the mediator, the outcome, uh, but these are defined traditionally as manipulations of those exposures. But of course, when you have race or sex as the exposure, you're not gonna manipulate that thing. So Tyler had this idea in this 2014 article to set up the disparity of that variable as the, the measure that you're interested in, and then how much that disparity would change after you adjust for the mediator. The idea is equalizing the mediator. Like if I am interested in the racial disparity and I define some kind, some kind of measure of socioeconomic status as my mediator, then the question is, how would that racial disparity change if I equalized so, social, um, social class or social status between these groups, right? If I have a black-white disparity in mortality, 
what would that disparity look like under conditions of equal social status? That's what this mediation question is answering. And they set up the machinery to do that in this 2014 article. It's complicated because of course, covariates that are affected by the exposure, which is race here, it affects a lot of things. You can't condition on those things, you have to marginalize over those things. So, you know, this is what makes this model kind of interesting. Um, but it, it's one way of answering this question that a direct effect between race and the outcome that's not mediated by these, that is social variable might be considered to be unacceptable, right? That if, if the races differ because they are different in socioeconomic status, that might be an explanation for that difference. Um, but if they differ for other reasons, then it's through some kind of direct bias. Um, so that, that's the sort of motivating set. Again, it, um, it sets up the experiment as kind of the gold standard, because here we're thinking about like randomly assigning people an SES um, so that there would be the same distribution of SES for blacks and whites. Uh, and then that becomes the explanation for the disparity, the potential explanation for the disparities. So I'll give you an example of how that might work in practice. So here's a study about gender differences in uh, grants awarded by the Gates Foundation. Right? So they looked at a whole bunch of grant applications uh, that were awarded by the Gates Foundation, and men won the grants more than women did. So you have a, a gender disparity there. So they start exploring mediators of that disparity. What mediates that disparity? Why is it that men are winning more? So they looked at um, the topic study, uh, measures of applicant quality. They look at a bunch of things trying to figure out what explains why men are winning these more than women. And they ended up explaining this disparity by men using broader words and women using narrower words on average, right? So a woman might send in a grant saying, I'm gonna cure uh, mesothelioma. And the man might write the same grant by saying, I'm gonna cure cancers. You know, And by using the broader word instead of the more specific word, the man's application got a higher score. When they adjusted for that use of broad versus narrow words, then the gender disparity went away. And you can see another example like this in like Pearl's book where he talks about the wage gap and the Berkeley sex discrimination case. It's the same kind of idea. You put in enough covariates into the model to explain away this gap. But there's a limitation to that kind of thinking that's based on the idea that these traits would be randomly assigned um, under the null. Like under the null, if there's no discrimination, these things would be just randomized, you know, just like in a randomized trial, they would be equally distributed between the two groups. So I'll give an example where this experimental kind of foundation for this falls apart. Here's another gender bias example. Um, these authors, Adams and colleagues, looked at 50 years of um, art sales, sales of paintings. Um, it's something like, I don't remember the exact number, but like you know, 2 million auctions or something crazy like that over 50 years. And art by women artists, uh, has a sale price that's 40% lower than art by male artists. So there's a big gender disparity. So again, they started looking for mediators of that disparity. What are covariates that might explain why there's this difference between male and female artists? You know, is it because of the subject matter? Like women tend to paint flowers and men tend to paint horses, you know, something like that. And maybe horses get a higher price than flowers. When they adjusted for those subject matter things about the painting, like what is the, what is the content of the painting, then the gender differences got even bigger. So that wasn't the explanation. They, again, they kept looking at other strata. Uh, they looked at very high price painting versus other paintings. They stratified in a bunch of different ways. They couldn't get rid of this. So they ended up doing a bunch of experiments in order to see if there was direct discrimination. So first experiment they did, um, they showed lesser known paintings to a large number of participants asking them to guess the gender of the artists, right? So they didn't know the gender of the artist in this case, because they're not by known artists and the respondents did no better than chance. Okay, so not anything about what men paint versus women paint or the ability of men and women to paint. They did another experiment. They generated uh, new paintings by computer, artificial intelligence that generates paintings. So obviously the, the artist has no real gender in this case. And they asked people to um, assign a gender to these paintings and um, there was uh, no difference again. Uh, wait a minute. The use of computer gen generate paintings. Oh, and randomly assign the paintings to be labeled as being by a woman or by a man. 
And then the paintings by women artists got a lower value, a lower estimated value. So this seems to be pretty strong experimental evidence that the pricing is biased by gender in a way that's irrational, right? That's simply discrimination against female art, uh, artists. Does it prove gender bias? Unfortunately, there's another alternative explanation that cannot be evaluated by these experiments. And that's the idea of what economists used to call, uh, or maybe they still call, um, statistical discrimination. And that's the following idea, that if the raters know the prices of all artwork, right? They have a database, like imagine an artificial intelligence program that has a database of all paintings and all prices assigned to all paintings. And this artificial intelligence program is not biased by gender at all, but it uses every covariate that it knows in order to predict the price of a painting. And when it puts in gender, it sees that paintings by women artists are valued at 40% less, then it will use that covariate in order to predict the price of a woman's painting as being less. And in that way, it will get a higher uh, precision of its prediction. It will improve its prediction of the price because it's using this database of prices that's already riddled with existing discrimination. So now um, in, in computer science, we refer to this as algorithmic bias because it's you know, an unbiased algorithm. You know, the computer doesn't care whether you're male or female. It's just using all the information in the database, but the database is full of human judgments that are infused with this kind of sexism. And so the algorithm uses that information in order to be just as sexist. Right? And in that way, it improves its accuracy of its prediction, but not because it has some animus against women, but just because it's using the humans as the gold standard. So this, this cannot be um, investigated with the randomized trial in the same way, because uh, the computer is just using the existing data in order to make the best decision it can make. This happens in medicine as well. The same kind of algorithmic bias happens in medicine. So here's a famous paper by Shulman and colleagues. They um, created a script uh, of a patient giving a presentation to a cardiologist about chest pain. And uh, they videotaped actors reading the script and they had the actors be male or female, black or white. And they showed these videos to cardiologists at a conference and they asked these cardiologists to refer or not refer the person for right heart catheterization. Um, and there was a gender, um, Actually, it was an interaction. It was Black women who got referred less than the other groups. Okay, but the interesting part of this result is that these patients were all reading exactly the same words. They had all kinds of other differences in their characteristics. The women were uh, friendlier. Um, they were um, more dependent. Um, black men had lower socioeconomic status. Um, the Black men were more likely to miss appointments. Uh, black men were less likely to comply with treatment. Right? These are all statistically significant differences between the groups of actors reading the exact same script. So the conclusion of the authors, of course, is that the cardiologists are biased. They're using racial stereotypes in order to make judgments about patients, even though the patients are reading the exact same words. But there's a potential for the same kind of statistical discrimination that each clinician has a database in their head that might be accurate or might be a fantasy that's based on stereotyping that's completely irrational, but we can't discount the possibility that in their experience that they had more black men disappointments. And so they judge this black man to be more like a disappointments. That's just using information in the data set in order to make predictions. And it might be accurate or it might be a complete fantasy. We have no way of knowing based on the data that's here. We don't know what's in the clinician's head and whether that information is accurate or is completely uh, a fantasy, right? So there's no way we can evaluate the validity or lack of validity of that judgment. Okay, I'm gonna um, just have about 10 more minutes. So I'll give a couple of examples that I'm using for the book of recent controversies that around, uh, revolve around adjustment in order to demonstrate the critical nature of adjustment decisions for these kinds of social debates that we have about policy, about health, about uh, other outcomes in society, and the need for understanding better these adjustment strategies in light of 
setup that I just made over the last half an hour about how these adjustments are actually made or need to be made. So the first example comes from a New York Times article written in June of 2022, just six months ago. Uh, there's a New York Times columnist named uh, David Leonhardt. So he's got a master's from Yale in applied math or something. He's a quantitative guy, but he's a newspaper columnist now. And he did a lot of reporting about COVID. Um, and he wrote this article in June, uh, whoops, uh, noting that um, there was a big racial disparity in COVID mortality at the beginning of the pandemic, where minorities in the United States, uh, Black and Hispanic people, were dying at a much higher rate. You can see uh, this is Blacks at the very beginning of the pandemic having a much higher mortality rate than other groups. But then by the end of the pandemic, this red line here is whites. They're at the very bottom here at the beginning of the pandemic. And by the end of the pandemic, they're at the very top. They have the highest mortality rate by the end of the pandemic. And Leonhardt writes about this interesting flipping of the racial disparity. Uh, this is the same thing stratified now for 65 plus. You see the same pattern. And he says this, in his opinion, this is due to political differences. Uh, he says about 60% of Republican adults are vaccinated compared to 75% of independents and more than 90% of Democrats. Uh, Republicans are both disproportionately white and older. And this explains why the white death rate is significantly higher. Basically, the people dying at a higher rate late in the pandemic are un unvaccinated people. This is his explanation. So this released a huge storm of controversy, um, started with this uh, blog post by epidemiologist uh, Caitlin Jettelina, um, saying this is misinformation. Right? This is kind of a loaded term, misinformation. But she very directly said this is misinformation. The context missing here is Simpson's paradox, where an association between variables in a population emerges, disappears, or reverses when the population is adjusted divided into subgroups, stratified. Um, when we take into account confounders, um, it tells another story. In this case, we need to adjust for age. White Americans are more likely to outlive Black Americans. So you look at the age distributions, they differ. And age is the biggest predictor of dying of COVID. Because this is not age adjusted, this is misinformation. If you would just age adjust, you would see that minorities are still at higher risk of mortality. And then this released a, a Twitter storm of other epidemiologists piling on, saying that Landhard was irresponsible, incompetent, and should be fired. Uh, epidemiologist at Yale says this is irresponsible, wrong, misinformation, no excuse. Why does this happen? Because no one fact checks this man. No one checks his analysis. Inexcusable. People are not very nice on Twitter. I don't know if you are aware of this. Um, another epidemiologist says, undergrad level science reporting. It's all place gets this garbage peer reviewed. Get a real public health expert. Um, someone whose handle is data driven MD says, I call for a second, or a second I second this call for a retraction. Um, time to take Leonhardt off the COVID beat. He's done enough harm, so forth. Um, get someone who knows what he's talking about. So Leonhardt tried to respond to his critics by Twitter, unfortunately. Uh, this is how it's public discourse happens these days. And he said, okay, I agree that age is part of the story, but it's not the whole story. Uh, the age-adjusted analysis could also be interesting, but I'm talking about the real world here, not the age-adjusted world. I'm interested in the body count, like who's actually dying here. Um, you know, and so I think the analysis that I did still stands and it's quite reasonable. And by the way, I don't think it's fair if we disagree about adjustment to say that my analysis is misinformation. You know, we, there are several ways to look at this data set, and your way is not true, and mine is misinformation. Like, that's a little bit harsh. You know, so he's trying to be a little bit um, ecumenical about this, but they were the Twitter mob, as you know, can never be satisfied. So, yeah, they say, yeah, that's the difference between a journalist and a researcher, the difference between a novice and an expert, the difference between a sophomore and an epi class and a professor. That PhD is important, methodology. Right, like that's it's pretty nasty. David, you were wrong on this. Retract the story, issue a correction. We need experts. This requires expertise. Okay, so they, they were having none of this. I agree that age adjustment is kind of routine, right? We do tend to report all things in an age adjusted way, but I can think of several arguments here for why age adjustment would not necessarily be the right answer, the single right answer. 
So here are two of those arguments. Oh, sorry, there's more. David, stop. Have the common decency to say you're wrong. Your analysis was flawed. People have pointed out it's a first year public health mistake. Yeah, okay. Here's um, one reason. Why, why is the age distribution between blacks and whites in the United States different? Right? Is, like, is that a natural difference? Does it have to be that way? If your hypothesis was that racism caused a difference in COVID mortality rate, and racism also caused a difference in mortality rate in general, then racism affects um, age distribution and racism affects COVID mortality rate. So you're adjusting for mediating. You're adjusting for something that's affected by the exposure. Adjusting away part of that effect isn't necessarily the right answer. Right? So that's one argument for why age adjustment here might be an over-adjustment, right? Because you're getting rid of a piece of the, of, the, of the overall explanation for why there's a difference. Second argument is if age is different between blacks and whites and age is a, a predictor of getting a, a COVID mortality, why stop with age? Why are you then not obligated to adjust for all the other things that differ by race and our predictions of COVID mortality. For example, state of the United States. There are states like in this graph, New York State now has almost no racial disparity in mortality. It's down to about a gap of about one year difference. Whereas other states like Illinois have like a seven year gap in life expectancy between blacks and whites. So there's huge variation from state to state in life expectancy, and in COVID mortality. So why are we not also obligated to adjust by state? Or other things that differ between race and affect COVID mortality, like vaccination. Why not also adjust for vaccination? Why do you stop at age? Why, why is age enough, right? There's no good answer to that question. Like all these people on Twitter who are saying, you're absolutely wrong, the right answer is to adjust by age. It's a completely arbitrary distinction that age is the right answer for the covariate set. The variant set might have to be much larger than that if you wanted to get rid of all the other things that were imbalanced by race and affected COVID mortality. So those are two arguments. Now the interesting epilogue to this story is that Leonhard turned out to be completely right. When people went in and analyzed the data with age adjustment, the disparity was still reversed. So uh, this analyst writing on this R blog says, um, the crux of their argument was that there was a huge racial disparity, uh, is that there are still huge racial disparities after age adjustment. The white population is simply so much older. Well, I've checked and they're wrong about this. And so far as I can tell, no one of the critics actually did any direct age adjustment themselves. They just wrote on Twitter saying, you're an idiot, you should be fired. When they actually went down and did the age adjustment, they found that the, the disparity was still flipped. So all these epidemiologists were just shooting from the hip saying, you should be fired, you did this wrong because you didn't adjust for age. In fact, adjusting for age didn't change Leonhardt's story at all. He was completely right. Okay, second example. Um, this is a, a perfectly good article on um, uh, cervical cancer mortality in the United States, written by uh, Beavis and colleagues, published in the journal Cancer 2017. I, I don't have any complaints about this article, perfectly legitimate, interesting article, good methods, good data, um, but it does reveal an interesting choice about adjustment here. So they observed that previously published surveillance of cervical cancer mortality inequalities had not taken into consideration the race-specific prevalence of hysterectomy, which is the removal of the cervix. So if you don't have a cervix, you're not going to get cervical cancer, right? Like, you know, when we look at disparities in prostate cancer, we don't put women in the denominator there. So when we look at disparities by cervical cancer, their argument is we shouldn't have people with hysterectomy. And there's a big racial disparity in hysterectomy and it increases with age. And so when you look at that racial disparity in cervical cancer mortality, you include all those people in the denominator without a cervix, you're not getting, according to these authors, the right answer. So we don't have that data. Like when we have the death certificate that says you died of cervical cancer, we don't know whether you had a cervix or not, but they use survey data in order to estimate the denominator and remove that from the denominator. When they did that, um, the age standardized rate for cervical cancer mortality for black women 
went from 5.7 per 100,000 per year to 10.1 per 100,000 per year. And for white women, it went from 3.2 to 4.7. So they say that the racial mortality disparity was underestimated by 44%. Right, so that's you know ten point one divided by four point seven was the old one, and then when you uh, is the sorry is the new disparity. The old one was five point seven over three point two. Right, so we vastly underestimated the magnitude of that disparity by including people in the denominator who could not actually get the outcome. So this is their argument in the paper. I I, I agree with. The logic of that, but I also have some concerns about the logic, which is the authors never considered the, ramific considered the ramifications of defining hysterectomy as a permissible covariate. Like someone just said, well, it's my choice. I decided to remove my cervix and not get cervical cancer. And so, you know, that's just under my control. Like, you know, it's just some, some people decide to do this, some people decide not to do this. It doesn't really work that way, I don't think. It's not a lifestyle choice, you know? So, um, if I'm studying racial disparities, I'm not really sure I want to take that off the table, right? That is part of the way in which one group ends up getting more cervical cancer or not. Like, because people without a cervix really don't get cervical cancer. Like, it's not an artificial thing. It's not a, it's not a bias that I want to get rid of because it doesn't give me the true outcome. Like, it is one way to avoid cervical cancer, not the way I would recommend, but it is part of the real world. And so in a population in which one group is getting more hysterectomy and not getting cervical cancer, if I adjust that away, I'm not representing that real world pathway anymore, right? So that, I, you know, I have concerns about leaving that real world and going to an imaginary world in which hysterectomy rates are the same without any concern for the reasons for the racial disparity in hysterectomy. Like if I performed a hysterectomy on 100% of black women, I'm not recommending that this happen by any means, but there would be no cervical cancer in that group. Like, um, or if I had one black woman who did not have a hysterectomy and she got cervical cancer, then the rate in that group would be 100%. I would say 100% of all black women get cervical cancer. That, that doesn't make sense either. Like there's a, there's a fundamental logical problem with thinking about this adjusted number as the one you want to, Use. Um, and you can see this confusion even more dramatically in the press, right? So the headlines are things like cervical cancer death rates are much higher than thought. But that's not actually what they found. They didn't say that the cervical cancer death rate was much higher than thought, right? The press release says a new analysis reveals that for most women, the risk of dying from cervical cancer is higher than they thought. No, that's, that's not what, there's nothing to do with that factually not correct because women who don't have a cervix really don't get cervical cancer. So your death rate, if you have a hysterectomy really of cervical cancer really is zero, right? It, it's not the adjusted, we have this idea that when, because adjustment renews a bias, the adjusted number must be, must, must be truer than the unadjusted number. And that's not true here. The, the adjusted number is not truer. It might be fairer in some sense, but it's not truer. That, that's an important point that I wanted to get across. Newsmax said, cervical cancer rates shockingly underestimated. No, that's not at all what they did or what they said, right? So the fact that the public discourse around these things doesn't understand adjustment is the challenge I have in writing this book. Not that I can really explain this very well, but um, that's what I'm trying to think about. Okay, the very last example, and then we can discuss this, um, is about another epidemic in the United States, which is uh, police officers killing civilians. Um, actually, been a big news item in the United States uh, this week. Um, but um, I'm particularly interested in hearing uh, police officers shooting civilians, which was not the news story this week. But um, police shoot about 1,000 Americans a year, shoot and kill about uh, somewhere between 1,000 and 1,200 Americans every year. Uh, which is a huge number of people being murdered by law enforcement officers. Um, and there's certainly a lot of concern about the fact that there's a racial disparity in these police shootings. Um, blacks make up about 13% of the US population, but they make about 26% of all people murdered by police. So there's some obvious concern about a racial disparity in being shot by the police. 
Um, in 2016, a very famous black economist named Roland Fryer at Harvard published a paper um, in which he did a massive data collection and analysis exercise, really incredible uh, effort, and published the conclusion that, or as described here in the press, the conclusion that there was no racial bias in shootings of black people by police. Right? When this is quoting from the New York Times, when it comes to the most lethal form of violence, police shootings, the study finds no racial bias. Right? Not exactly what he said in the paper. So what he did in the paper was he had a conditional model, like adjusting for a bunch of things and this logistic regression. Um, and indeed, the coefficients here are on the protective side of the null, but they're not significant for race here. Um, but they're uh, on the protective side of the null. So he interprets this as being null. Um, but this is conditional on an important covariate, which is his data set involved only people who are having an encounter with the police, right? So I'm, I'm there face to face with the police officer, and I'm interested in the probability that the police officer shoots me, and being black is protected in this final adjusted analysis, conditional on the fact that you're already there being stopped by the police. Um, you might worry about selection into that data set. Do police stop people randomly, or do they stop people on the basis of race? Um, he only had a data set of stopped individuals, so he couldn't answer that question. He addressed the question in his paper. He did talk about this, and he said, it's difficult to understand selection bias in this data set because I don't really know how people enter into these encounters with the police. He said, from previous literature, estimates vary from 323% more likely to be stopped to 47% less likely to be stopped. So I don't know. There's no way for me to know the process by which police select people to be stopped. He says, um, if one assumes that police are non-strategic in stopping behavior, that, that's a euphemism for saying, if you assume that police are racist, right? Then actually you'll find in my analysis that police shoot black people more often. However, if you assume that police are professionals and they know what they're doing and they know who to stop because this person looks like a criminal, then you find that there's no racial bias. It's basically saying, if you assume that police are not racist, then you will find that they are not racist. And yet what was in the paper, uh, the newspaper was simply the statement that he finds no racial bias. Not, which would have been the more correct statement, I find no racial bias because I assume in my analysis that there's no racial bias. A lot of other social scientists immediately jumped on this and recognized this as a collider stratification bias problem, right? You can think of this as two ways to get stopped. You can be, you know, a vicious criminal and be, you know, obviously a vicious criminal, or you can be a minority. And both of those are reasons why you might get stopped. And this means that even if those traits are independent in the source population, if nothing to do with each other, if I know you're a violent criminal, I don't know your race, it doesn't give me any information about your race. If I know your race, it doesn't give me any information about whether you're a violent criminal, right? Among the people who are stopped, they will be negatively correlated, right? If you didn't get stopped because you're a minority, you're more likely to be a violent criminal. If you didn't get stopped because you're a violent criminal, you're more likely to be a minority, right? That's the way collider stratification bias works. And it makes sense then that black race would be protected, right? Because it means that like the, the black population that's stopped by the police is enriched with non-criminal people. Right, and the criminal population that stopped is enriched with non-minority people. Right, this is the logic of collider stratification bias. So all of these critics wrote in and said, "You can't do this analysis. Like, you can't assume anything about racial bias when you're conditioning on this collider." And as best I can tell, Fryer just completely ignored these people. He just didn't answer them. Um, but then he got the same critique from a Nobel laureate, from Jim Heckman. So then he had to answer, you know, he couldn't like not answer Jim Heckman. So then in his response, um, this is Heckman's critique, which Heckman doesn't use DAG, so it's a little bit hard to tell what he's talking about here, but he's basically making the same argument. 
And Fryer responds to this and says, I'm not saying anything about racial bias in my paper. I'm only referring to conditional disparities, right? I conditioned on this, on being stopped, and I'm looking at the disparity conditioned on that. And I think that's interesting, but I agree. It doesn't say anything about racial bias. But then when he gives an interview to the newspaper, he says, I'm studying racial bias, and there was no racial bias in shooting, right? So I, I listened to all kinds of interviews with him in which he said, oh, yeah, I found out the police don't shoot Black people any more than they shoot white people. Um, you know, I did this analysis and this is what I found. But in the paper, he's very careful to, to not say that, right? So um, again, there's a distinction between the public discourse that ignores these complex issues of adjustment and the formal paper, which the public doesn't see or read or understand, in which these are addressed a little bit more formally. Okay, so I have to conclude because I'm already like eight minutes over here. Uh, we learn techniques and apply them in rote fashion, too busy to think about the logic and justifications of routine operations, right? We go through school, we learn to adjust for covariates. The more you adjust, the better. Go, you know, have fun with that, right? So that's obviously not going to work here. We're accustomed to thinking of adjustments as removing bias. So it becomes, an assume, it becomes assumed that the adjusted result is more true than the unadjusted result. And that's clearly wrong. But it's, it's our fault for teaching this kind of idea that adjustment is like this hurdle. If you get over the hurdle and you're still, you know, P less than 105, yes, straight to New England Journal of Medicine, right? So that, that's a dangerous way of thinking. Several examples highlight that media coverage of papers, which is the public discourse, removes caveats and assumptions and thereby creates a very misleading account of the research. Things that the, the, the investigator themselves wouldn't have said or are careful to say only in their paper, but not in the newspaper interview or whatever, because um, there's not a public understanding of these subtleties around adjustments. And then statistics is naively taught as objective, right? We're, we're taught that like a machine could do this, right? Like we could program a machine to do all these statistical adjustments, you know, machine learning and all this stuff, because it's just a technical thing, but it's not. It's about values. It's about some kind of ethical judgment about what differences are allowable, what differences are not allowable. And machines are not going to know about these kinds of ethical distinctions about, you know, should this person die more? Should this person get shot more? Right? These are value judgments that are things that only humans could know about. Okay, that's what I wanted to say. Beauty of math, of course, is that we don't even need an ethicist. And I'm saying the opposite. You do need an ethicist. Okay, um, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much.